anybody with blocks? I have, and so did Frank Lloyd Wright. But the blocks that Frank Lloyd Wright played with are very special. They were designed by a German educator named Friedrich Froebel. Froebel believed that really little children could learn about not just their family and their connection to the town or the city, but their state, but they could learn about the whole universe if they were given the proper educational tools. In fact, he coined the term kindergarten, kinder for children, garden for, for garden. And he felt if you nourish children the way you nourish flowers, well, they would blossom and they would learn that everything in the world is interconnected. There's a unity. So for this purpose, he developed these special blocks. And these are the blocks that Frank Lloyd Wright played with. Now you may notice that some of them have little uh, gadgets on the end, and they actually hang from the thing on the left, the sticks on the left, and they hang like this. Wright called it a mast. And if you spin a block, for example, if you spin a cylinder in a certain way, you will see a sphere inside. Now I have a very short video, one minute and 20 seconds, to show you because it really will indicate, I think, why Wright got sucked into this and why the blocks were so important throughout his whole life. So bear with me. The second gift of the kindergarten, of Froebel's kindergarten, was like his trademark for some kind of business almost. The, the, the kindergarten, this was the symbol of kindergarten and it was, it's interesting because it was it was like Hegel for children. The thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. The cube is pure stability, the sphere is pure motion, and the cylinder is both, having flat sides and curved sides. It's interesting how they, the, uh, he, they use this with children. They would, spin the, they would spin these things on different axes, and if you spin the, the cube on a certain axis, you can actually see a cylinder inside. And if you spin a cylinder on a, on a certain axis, you can see a, a, uh, a sphere inside. So he was able to show little children this idea of continuity, of nothing stands, stands alone in the universe. The idea of, sort of infinity of, of connections and unity. Unity was Froebel's most popular word in his writings. But it was, it was like a magic trick, really, for children <laughs> to uh, to show them this, this idea of um, one within the next. It's funny that it became so important in the kindergarten system that children would spin these objects. So at age 32, and again in his 90s, Wright said, the maple wood blocks are in my fingers to this day. He said he learned from playing with the frontal blocks that everything in the world is interconnected, what do we call this today, interconnectivity? If you dump chemicals in the water and then you're going to drink it, or if you have fires in Australia and it's going to pollute the air. Sustainability. Everything is interconnected, which we now know. And uh, Froebel was talking about that a long time ago. So Wright said that early kindergarten experience with the straight line the flat plane, the square, the triangle, the circle. If I wanted more, the square modified by the triangle gave the hexagon. The circle modified by the straight line would give the octagon. If I wanted two, two dimensions getting into sculpture, adding thickness, the square became the cube. The triangle, the tetrahedron. The circle, the sphere. Wright believed that these geometric shapes had symbolic power. The circle represented infinity, the triangle, structural unity, the spire, aspiration, the spiral, organic progress, and the square, integrity. 
Now you're probably wondering, how can geometric shapes have symbolic power, spiritual power? Yet to Frank Lloyd Wright, they did. Let's look at Wright's personality to see if we can understand how he could see spiritual power in geometry. Wright's life was an amazing saga of devious dealings, double cross, divorce, arson, murder, jail, many successes and many failures. And throughout it all, he couldn't stop by Japanese art, which is why for the next 40 minutes, we're going to talk about blocks, buildings, gardens, and Japan. Now Wright's personality was a bundle of contradictions. On the one hand, he was a great husband and good father. On the other hand, he ran off with another man's wife. Sometimes he would borrow from his clients. And then instead of paying back the loans that he that should have been paid back, he'd go out and buy himself a sports car. In fact, he'd have it modified to suit his design needs, where he might buy another Japanese work of art. Sometimes he would grovel when he was destitute, begging his clients for money. But at other times, he was so proud that he would say, six years before he died, I defy anyone to name a single aspect of the best contemporary architecture that wasn't first done by me. <laughs> so, Wright had to fight his demons. He had a complicated personality, but there were many positive sides to it. Wright was a Renaissance man. Sorry, I thought that out there. Okay. He was a Renaissance man like Leonardo da Vinci. He was a polymath, which means he was an expert in many different fields. So most people think of him as an architect, but actually the only formal study he had was in engineering. And it's really important that he had that engineering study because his most famous buildings succeeded because of his studies in engineering. The Guggenheim Museum, Falling Water, the uh, administration building with the Johnson Wax. By the way, this wonderful story about the lily pad columns at the Johnson Wax administration building. Wright said he saw a waiter carrying a tray, and he realized that on a few fingertips he could balance this huge tray. And that gave him the idea well, he could have these columns with a very tiny, thin base and a wide top. And he proved to be right. So engineering was really important. Wright was, of course, known most for his architecture, and he built over 400 buildings. But he was also a landscape designer. And certainly for the Roby houses, he believed in building in planter boxes and urns so that his clients would, he hoped, fill them with flowers and vines and connect the building, which he wanted to be organic, from organic materials related to nature, relate the building to nature. When he was a landscape designer and allowed, like with his own property, he designed everything all the way to the horizon, like Capability Brown in Britain. So, Wright would take the lower boughs off some trees so that he could see into the distance. And he planted his fields, he said, in curvilinear patterns because it was pleasing to the eye. And he also liked to have cows for that reason. Wright was a designer of paintings, like this one for the children's playroom, which is from a tale for the Arabian Nights. Someone else executed it, but he designed it. He also did mosaics. Look at the sparkling gold and silver around this weeping willow tree. And Wright designed sculpture. Here you see the loggia outside his office and studio at Oak Park. The tree of knowledge, uh, sorry, the, the tree of life is supported by the book of knowledge. And below that are two storks, left and right, with an unfurled architectural plan between them. And the storks stood for fertility, creativity, which of course Bryce had a lot of. He was also a graphic designer. He would design everything, not only plates, rugs, posters, you name it. In addition to all that, Wright wrote more than 20 books, including his autobiography. 
And he designed the cover and the frontispiece, the dividers inside the, the book. Well, if that wasn't enough, Wright was also a musician, an accomplished pianist, just like his father. And when he designed this windmill at Tellius, he designed it specifically so he could blare Beethoven to the cows <laughs> and to his apprentices working in the field. That's how much he loved music. He couldn't do without it. Now, when I was working on this talk, I noticed that all every scholar, 500 scholars, have mentioned that this windmill is combined with two geometric shapes, the diamond and the octagon. But I didn't read it, anybody saying, why? Probably because it's an homage to Fermi. And if you look at the left screen, left uh, slide, you see a tower was built in honor of Fermi just before Wright did his windmill, and it's composed of two geometric shapes. Breaking news, breaking news. Wright sometimes was a glass designer. In fact, he was a glass designer well into the 1930s. Here you see the windows for the Durham Martin House. So he took the tree of life, but he put it in <coughs> geometric shapes. He would also design, oops, what happened there? Furniture. And if given the opportunity, he would design everything in the room or in the house. So for example, at the Barnstall House, now called Hollyhock House in Los Angeles, he designed not only the skylight and the chairs and the table and the light fixtures, very large sculptural things to the left and the right, but <laughs> he also designed that relief over the fireplace and he insisted that Eileen Barnsdale buy these Japanese screens. So she installed them as he instructed to the left right of the fireplace. Now there's a really interesting story that goes with this. After they finished the house, he said, Wright said, she didn't pay him the full amount due. And therefore, he wanted the screens back in payment. And of course, she said no. So what did he do? In the middle of the night, he sent a sheriff into Aileen Barnsdale's house to get those screens and bring them back, which the sheriff did. And then Aileen Barnsdale put up a $100,000 bond, and she got them back. Now, you'd think by this time they wouldn't be speaking, right? Well, after that, she actually commissioned Wright to do more work, and her daughter went to study at Taliesin. <laughs> Somehow he had the magic touch. Wright was also an innovator. He developed the concept for an open plan. Are you all looking forward to going work in an open plan where everybody can hear everything you're saying and it's real noisy? Well, you can blame Franklin Wright for that. He also thought of the idea of the carport in warmer climate, climate, climates and the ranch style house on one floor. But probably today, the most important thing that he invented was the solar house. Now the solar house, you know, Wright realized that landscaping could be a very important part of building green. And so he designed this heat sink for this house. So the garden and all the glass windows face this area which gets the hot sun. And then because it was very windy there on that site, he had evergreens planted to mitigate the impact of the wind. And on the plan, the circle at the top right was to house the utilities, and then there was an earth berm, excuse me, tunnel to get in the back from the back into the house. And so Wright was way, way ahead of his time. He said, a good building is not one that hurts the landscape, but one that makes the landscape more beautiful than it was before the building was built. I believe in God. Only I spell it nature with a capital N. Now Wright was also a collector of Japanese prints and Japanese art. Whenever there were no architectural commissions, he would sell Japanese prints. In fact, he sold so many Japanese prints to major collectors that those collectors ended up giving them to important museums throughout the United States. So for example, the collections at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York 
the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, the Chicago Art Institute, the Chasen Museum, formerly the Elmheim of the University of Wisconsin. All those um, Japanese prints, or a good part of them, passed through Wright's hands on the way to the museum. And he became an expert in Japanese art. So you can see this was no minor avocation. This was absolutely Wright's <coughs> passion. Now, having discussed all these aspects of Wright, why would I talk about Japan? Well, first I'm going to tell you a story. Wright was a genius at retaining clients. He just knew how to do it. What was his secret? Well, if you've heard this story before, it's about a leaky roof. Just ask yourself, why is she telling this story again? And I'll tell you, it reveals Wright's uncanny ability to not only manage his clients, but one might say manipulate them and get him to be hired, them to hire him, not once, not twice, but sometimes three times. So this story is told by Sam Johnson, Hib Johnson's son, and Hib was the head of the S.C. Johnson Company, Johnson West. So this house had been built by Wright. It's called Wingsbrook for Johnson after the administration building. And you can see there's a lot of roofs there. Well, <laughs> the roof had been leaking now and then. And on this particular occasion, they were having a dinner party, and Sam Johnson told the story. It was raining cats and dogs. Suddenly, the water began to drip on my father's bald head. <laughs> my father flew into a rage. Get me that phone, he yelled. Then a little more quietly, he said to the operator, which is what you had to do in those days, get me Frank Lloyd Wright in Phoenix, Arizona. And when Wright came on the phone, he said, hi, Mr. Johnson, how's it all going? He said, well, Frank, we love your architecture, and you know we love this house. But your roof, it's raining right now, and your roof is leaking right on my head. To which Wright replied, well, Hill, why don't you move your chair? <laughs> so, point being, that he had an incredible sense of humor and he knew how to handle his clients. He had a spot. He wasn't about to let one of his clients demean him, even though he needed them, and they had much more money than he did. Also, he had a great sense of humor. So when he made this drawing, and presented it to the Guggenheim the committee, for example. He called it the masterpiece. But then look what he put in the drawing. A little girl dropping a yo-yo into the rotunda. Just that light touch. And you know, humor can diffuse so many situations. I wish I were better at it. And you all might want to practice it, because it really works with your clients when they're furious about something. He was also a self-promoter, and for example, he was asked to do the Illinois State Building, and somebody said, quit just joking, you know, why don't you make it half a mile high? And Wright said, to hell with that, I'll make it a mile high. So he designed this tower, and you can see he showed the buildings all around as sort of midgets. Well, he went one step further, he held a press conference, and in back of him was a visualization of this mile high building. It was 22 feet high, the visualization. So he really knew how to promote himself. Now today, you know better than I, he would have a Facebook page and a blog and an Instagram account and all that. But he was an amazing self-promoter. Also, clients recognized and respected his genius. And they liked to be associated with him for his charisma and his genius. They felt that some of that fame might rub off on them, and they would go down in history as enablers of genius, if not genius themselves. So, why am I speaking about Japan today? Well, in November I went to Japan for one month, looking at traditional buildings and contemporary architecture. And I came away thinking, wow, there's a lot more here than I had realized. In my previous book, Building with Nature, I mentioned Japan 
24 times, but I could have mentioned it more. And in my book on Fred Clark Wright, I realized, hey, there's a lot more to this. So when I came back, I decided to do some research on Wright and Japan. And just then, Professor Bross called, and he asked me if I would like to give this talk. So I told him what I was working on, and he said, oh, that would be a great talk. Thank you. So that's why I'm here, and that's why I'm talking about Wright and Japan today. So, Japan was closed society until 1853. At that point, Commodore Perry opened Japan to the West, and all of Europe went bonkers over everything Japanese. Monet painted his wife as La Japonaise. Whistler did this dining room for a wealthy man in London to house his ceramics collection. And Whistler was inspired by Japanese screens. It's called the Peacock Room. And you can see it. It's at the Freer Gallery in Washington, D.C. now. It's part of the Smithsonian. And Van Gogh collected prints. And he was a dealer, not on the scale of Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, but he liked the Japanese prints so much that he even was inspired to do a few paintings related very closely to the Japanese prints. But it was not until 1876 and the Philadelphia Centennial that the United States really started to get interested in Japan. The Centennial had a Japanese bazaar, and it was filled with objects from Japan, exotic objects like nobody had ever seen before. Japanese wallpaper, textiles, vases, prints. And so all of a sudden, there was this craze for things Japanese. And everybody wanted to have some Japanese objects. And if they were wealthy enough, you know, do a whole room a la Japanese. And so it really started to take off. Now, one of the most prominent architects at that time was McKim, Mead, and White. And they did this Japanese interior for the Newcomb House in New Jersey. And Wright would have known about it because it was well publicized. If you look on the left side, you'll see there's some soji screens. And above those, there's kind of fretwork, which you see all over Japan, that open lattice work between one room and another. Now look at the ceiling. The beams are right angles to each other. That's traditional in many Japanese houses. Also, the floor, instead of having tatami mats, but it does have a geometric key pattern. So when Wright started his first job with Joseph Lyman Silsby, he found that Silsby was collecting Japanese art. In fact, Silsby had two rooms filled with Japanese art, so much so that it was illustrated in, I think it was England Magazine. And Wright came in contact, of course, with Silsby and maybe went to his house and saw the art. But more importantly, Silsby had a cousin. The man's name was Fenelosa. And that cousin had spent years in Japan studying Japanese art. And when he came back to the United States, he often visited Silsby. And he became the first curator of Japanese art at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Now, Silsby owned some tall, <coughs> narrow prints that Wright called pillar prints. And Wright said, I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> it was about this time that I started collecting the pillar prints. And then later, he designed this print stand just for his collection of pillar prints. Well, Wright left uh, Silsby after about a year, and he went to work for a more prominent architect, Louis Sullivan. As he started to work for Sullivan, he said, you know, I want to get married, and I have to have a five-year contract. So Sullivan said, OK. He really liked Wright's work. And then Wright went back to him and said, well, we got married and we're going to have a family, and now I want to build a house. Will you lend me the money? So Sullivan lent him the money. So you can see he knew how to manipulate not just clients, but also his bosses. <laughs> anyway, so we built this house in Oak Park. And some scholars say that it was probably inspired by Bruce Price's house on the left, which was done at Tuxedo Park just north of New York. 
And Bruce Price was very interested in Japanese architecture. And he said about Tuxedo Park, well, actually, it's loosely based on a Japanese village. And there was another house there called the Japanese Cottage. Now, all over Japan, you can see these houses with large gables roofs, where the roof overhangs and comes down to the first floor. So I think both of them were probably inspired by Japanese art. Wright would have seen Japanese prints with lots of houses, and he would have probably had some books that had been published just about this time. There's a very well-known book by Edward Morse called The Japanese House. It had everything you could possibly want to know about the Japanese house. What it looked like on the outside, on the inside, the garden, the path through the garden, access to the house, and so forth. So I think both of them were inspired by Japan. Now, the East Coast wasn't the only place that went nuts over Japan. The West Coast did, too. In Piedmont, California, across the bay from San Francisco, they built a tea house, exact copy of one in Japan, in 1890. And then for San Francisco, for the Midwinter Exhibition, they have a Japanese tea house and garden, and that's still there in San Francisco. Maybe you've seen it. So what kind of house was Wright doing in 1893? Oh, by the way, Sullivan fired him because he started moonlighting and doing houses for friends of his. But typical right, even though they had a falling out later in, say, 1927, Sullivan ended up writing two essays praising right to the skies. So they became fast friends again. Anyway, this was the kind of house that Wright was doing in 1893. Of course, you have to do what your clients want, right? But they usually want more traditional or what they see around them. And then something radical happened. The Chicago World's Fair. And at the fair, everything was white except the Japanese building. It was called the Japanese, it was called the White City, right? All the buildings were in the Renaissance style, which were copies of the Greek and Roman style. And they had pillars and columns, and they were tall and elegant. And here it was a Japanese structure that was low, and it was made of wood inside and out. It didn't have any big pillars and columns. And it was human scale. This was based, this Phoenix Hall at the Japanese fair, at the Chicago fair was based on this Phoenix Hall outside of Kyoto. Gorgeous, isn't it? And so I think that this was unlike anything that Wright had seen, except in books and on print. And he, of course, wanted to be very different, his architecture, to be very different from other architecture, too. So I think that everything changed after he saw these buildings at the Chicago Fair. And he built this stable for the Winslow family. And if you look about at it, it's similar to what we saw at the Chicago Fair and in Kyoto. Let me come back again. So let's compare all three of them. It has a large central hall, low connecting passageways going to shorter, shorter than the central buildings at the side, and wide spreading roof. So I think that everything changed for Roy after he saw the Japanese architecture at the Chicago World's Fair. To me, this is almost a quotation of the stables of the fair buildings. Now, he also did the house for the Winslows, and that also has a low hip roof, wide spreading eaves, so, why am I stressing this point? It's 6 o'clock. <laughs> that was my favorite. <laughs> so, I'm stressing this because Wright only admitted three influences. Louis Sullivan, Froebel Blocks, and the Japanese print not Japanese architecture. So when, so when he was having his designs published in Europe, in Berlin, the Wildwood Portfolio in 1911, 
he asked a friend of his, uh, Ashby, who was an arts and crafts architect, to write the introduction. And when Ashby came back with that introduction, he had one sentence that said, write, copy Japanese architecture. And Wright flew into a rage. I never copied Japanese architecture. I digested it. I absorbed it. But I didn't copy it. And it did not influence me. And he made him take out that sentence. So when, you, when I finish this talk, maybe you'll let me know whether you think that I'm right or not. So there were three things that Wright admired about the Japanese print. Four things, I'm sorry. Simplicity, nature, and the way the buildings harmonize with nature, and their democratic aspect. So what did he mean by simplicity? He didn't mean bare. A design could be very complex, but nothing insignificant was left there. Everything insignificant was removed, and that's what he wanted to do with his architecture. Now when it came to the buildings harmonizing with nature, he felt that the Japanese always positioned their buildings to relate to bodies of water, to trees. Um, just so beautifully integrated, they became one with nature. And he did the same thing with the Kumli house. He put in this lily pad garden, and you notice the triangular platform there. That was very much inspired by the platforms at Katsura Imperial Villa, where every building has a platform for viewing the moon. And he designed the house specifically so the main rooms overlook the garden. So he was really very much in love with gardens and landscape design. Now the third thing he liked was that the prints were democratic. Now what, what did he mean about that? He meant that they were cheap until he started dealing with the prints, and then they became expensive. But also that they showed the way of life of the ordinary people, like the peasants. Now, you think of Frank Lloyd Wright, hmm, is he particularly interested in the ordinary person? I mean, you think of his house in falling water, and other fabulous houses he designed, but there were two periods in his life when he was very interested in affordable architecture. So between 1915 and 1917, there wasn't much work. And so the Richards Company approached Wright and asked him if he wanted to design some affordable houses. And they advertised them as, I think it's called the Every Man Can Own an American House for Himself. And these houses, as you see, were supposed to be fairly simple. But they sold for $2,750, which is about $69,000 in today's money. And although Wright made a thousand, a thousand drawings for them, and there were seven different models, they actually didn't sell very many because they were undercut by Gustav Stickley and Craftsman Houses and by Sears Roebuck and their houses. Then the second period in his life, when he was interested in affordable housing, was when his friends Catherine and Herbert Jacobs wrote him a challenge. We challenge you to design a house for us that we can build for under $5,000. So, Wright designed the first Usonian house. What's Usonian? He took the letters out of the United States of America to make the word Usonian. And he called this house Usonian number one. Most of the Usonian houses, and there were a hundred built that we know of, most of them had floor to ceiling windows or very tall windows with clear story windows on top. And they faced the garden. They turned their back to the street. They also had radiant heating, underfloor radiant heating. And by this time, certainly people buying this kind of house could not afford servants. So their kitchen was made so that the wife could speak to the family while she was preparing meals. It was always assumed it would be the wife, of course. So, I told you about three things that he liked about the Japanese print. The simplicity, the harmony with the buildings with nature, and the democratic aspect. Uh, what was the fourth thing? Just guess. Geometry. Of course, back to Ferbal. 
These had absolutely underlying geometry. And it was all laid out for him by Hunkosai, who did eight volumes of how to draw and showed that everything in the world had underlying geometry, from the plants to the animals to the people. It was all interconnected. And Wright said, there resides always a certain spell power in any geometric form, which seems more or less a mystery, and is, as we say, the soul of the thing. The elimination of the insignificant is the most important consideration of Japanese artists after the fundamental mathematics of structure. So back to Freud again. Well, there were two times, well, no, take that back. Wright went to Japan for the first time in 1905. He went because his marriage was failing and he was hoping to repair it, but he told anybody who asked, he went in search of the print. So he also went in search of the Japanese print. And while he was there, Wright took several photographs. In fact, he took, well, we only have 55, but he probably took a lot more. And several of them were so composed as to be just like Japanese prints, inspired by Japanese prints. And this is one of them. Here she the other left with the big lantern, and then the right, right post that photo. And then he did peasants walking along the road, much the way he'd seen in the Japanese print. And he also did people on the road, similar to the ones he'd seen in other Japanese prints. The second major group of times he went to Japan, I have to put it, let's see, was when he got the commission for the Imperial Hotel in 1916 in Tokyo. And he ended up going to build a hotel between 1916 and 1922. He made six trips to Japan. And some of those trips he stayed as much as six months. So my point is, during six months he had plenty of time to travel around and see Japanese architecture as well as to buy Japanese art. And apparently, when he stopped drafting for an hour or so, the dealers were lined up, ready to sell their Japanese art. Anyway, this was a uh, hotel. was also a marvel of engineering, because shortly after it was finished, there was a major earthquake. And most of Tokyo fell down. But this building remained standing, the Imperial Hotel. And why? Because he knew that you shouldn't connect the floor and the, and the walls tightly. They had to be able to move independently, otherwise the building would collapse. He also knew that when there's an earthquake, there's usually a fire. So he insisted on having this body of water out in front. This is an old postcard. If you go to Japan, they tore down the building, sadly, very sadly. And they re rebuilt the lobby, but without that top section there, so if you go to a, out one of the many, there are, I think, 10 outdoor muse, architecture museums in Japan, and this uh, lobby is at Meiji Mura, it's called. Now Wright had seen many buildings in Japan with water. The Golden Temple was built on water in the lake, and then the uh, house below, they put in water into the garden. So when he did the Imperial Hotel, he put water in many courtyards. And the, the Imperial Hotel was just blooming. Every courtyard had gardens. The roofs had gardens. There were just the blossoms everywhere. So we're going to end this presentation very quickly with a marathon run. Keep your eyes on the screen. And I'm going to show you what I think are some of the main things that Wright took from Japanese prints and from Japanese architecture. Tell me at the end if you agree with me or not. Wright put a red square on every one of his renderings. And some of the squares had a square spiral inside of them, and some had his initials inside of them. And obviously, he took it from Japanese prints. There were red squares all over Japanese prints. Then the one point perspective, this huge open living room, where you could look through, he made sure that the furniture was low. You had this perspective view, 
and it was surrounded by geometrical forms, a ceiling in this case that he made very geometrical, the way you'd seen in Japanese prints. Then there was sculpture. For example, the sprite that he did for Midway Gardens, kind of cubistic sculpture, but she's in a kimono. And then his renderings for the Bosman portfolio. By the way, these renderings were done by a woman. She didn't get any credit, but uh, Marion Mahoney Griffiths. And um, Wright told her after coming back from his first trip to Japan in 1911, and he wanted the renderings to be even more Japanese. So you see here two trees in front, sort of blocking the view of the main element, the bridge or the house. Then he liked this perspective, very dramatic perspective, and he told his um, people working in the office, make the renderings very dramatic because that will appeal to your clients. Of course, today, you don't have any renderings, do you? You do everything on the CAD. Right? And anyway, in his day, he felt that was important. And then the Soji screens. Soji screens are all over Japan. As you see here, two different interpretations where you could look out on the garden and people couldn't see in. The globe lights, uh, I think, might have been inspired by the lanterns, but they also might have just been the spheres that came out of Fergal and all that study with geometric shapes. He did them in the Roby house, as you see here, and also in his own house, many different houses, and he surrounded the spherical globe light with a square of wood. And falling water. He saw so many prints with waterfalls and houses tucked just above the waterfall, like this one, or alongside the waterfall, when he finally got to falling water and saw that sight, he must have just been, oh my god, you know, all these images of Japanese prints in his mind. And sometimes he decorated the ridges of the roof on his buildings as he's seen it frequently done in Japan. I think the pagoda inspired the Johnson Research Tower and the alternating square and circular forms. On the left, the only day it rained when I was in Japan, you can see the alternating square, circular forms. And then Wright's love of nature. As he said, I go to nature every day for inspiration in the day's work. And I think he was inspired to leave this tree in the corridor that connects his house with his studio and office in Oak Park. It's still there. If you go on a tour, you have to ask to see it. They don't show it to you. But instead of cutting down the tree, he left it there. I think he'd seen so many Japanese houses where the wood inside was left, well, not raw, but it wasn't planed down or smooth, so it looked really like tree trunks. And finally, when he came back from Japan in 1922, this house had had a fire and it needed to be remodeled. And so he made the gable at the end much, much bigger than it had been before, and brought it all the way down to the first floor, having seen so many houses in Japan, praying hands, they're called, these houses with the huge gable roof. So now we've had a romp, a journey quickly through Wright's life, and I hope you'll remember four things at least, blocks, buildings, gardens, and Japan. Thank you very much.